space. But yeah, you're right, separation, you have to separate uh, people you know are ill and people who don't have the flu. That means you have to have a very quick test for it and that'll be the problem. Supplies and storage, everyone knows about that. That's because we have just-in-time supplies in this hospital right now. So if you want to put three, year, a three months supply, you're going to have to store it somewhere. And that will mean cost. And self-preservation is really uh, interesting. And it's not just the staff. I mean, staff is nurses, doctors, all these people and others. If, you know, I'm just saying, if, 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 let's say if you're a young, uh, young doctor with two small kids and we have a pan epidemic, you're going to call Dr. Lou and say, you go in, Dr. Lou, but you're an old guy and you're retired, <laughs> which is fine. But self-preservation means more than that. Hospitals will try and self-preservation, I have a feeling. In other words, if we know there's an epidemic in Toronto, and, you know, uh, we're going to actually say we will take some patients here if we sort of know. So those things have to be decided. And from a patient point of view, we, you know, in the last panic, we had patients who came off the plane in Toronto, knew they were a bit sick, and because they, they knew that everything was in Toronto, they just came to KW Emerge. So patients will try to self-preserve them. I'm not saying self-preservation is wrong, I'm just saying this is what's going to happen. And let's face it, the country is going to self-preservate. We saw that before. We know that Canada is going to, they're not going to take people from Hong Kong who are there, you know. So self-preservation is really one of, actually I actually made it the fourth S when we had this. And uh, the next slide, this was just not a joke. This is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, should the epidemic happen, it really will be a bad day to be human. And this is not to be an alarmist, okay? Because we may be alarmists now, but should there be a present, uh, should there be a, a pandemic, we won't be alarmists anymore, you know? So, and uh, don't expect the government to save us. That's the other thing that came down from the US. The US federal government's already said, and downloaded, <coughs> and they say, you make pandemic planning now. If it happens, we, the federal government, will not have the resources. There's not going to be, you know, a movie star hero to come in and the government's going to quite uh, clean mm -hmm. things out. Yeah. There's, there's an interesting quote on, on that uh, uh, about planning by, by Larry Brilliant. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he does a lot of stuff for the uh, UN uh, on, on public uh, health and such. And he said, you know, whatever anybody talks about for pandemic planning now, you know, sounds alarmist and way over the top. You know, even, you know, like you say, well, you're just, you know, a little crazy. It's like Y2K and all this sort of stuff. But once a pandemic happens, any plan, no matter how alarmist and how far out, will not be enough at the time. You know, just about every plan that's going to be, that's going to be put in place will be not enough. So anyway, uh, we're ready to uh, demonstrate advice, and then uh, if anybody asks, wants to ask any questions. Um, well, it depends, you know, if you have to get people together, like it doesn't, you don't need, uh, once the program is in place controlling the, the controller, then you could, uh, you just could program it, like, you know, the program, say you wanted to build 50, uh, you could program 50 of those controllers in a couple hours. Also, if you build one before, it's only this was a good deal of trial and error. But basically, for every brand and model of controller, it has to have an old program. So is the, is the idea then to make these in sufficient amounts so if and when the pandemic hits, there's enough ventilators to go around? Is that the idea? Well, the idea is, if, if you were going to plan ahead, if you had enough foresight to plan ahead, then we, you would build the one like that guy is designing in the U.S. Because it's a much more capable unit. It approaches the capabilities of, of what you know, a normal ventilator is, but you can build them for a few hundred dollars. Uh, but this is sort of like, you know, we always, in, 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 when, you know, us as techs, we always have what we call back pocket plans, right? You know. We talk about all the plans that we're going to do, but we say, well, if the water goes out and all this sort of thing, if things really get bad, 
this is what they'll do. And usually they involve things that aren't really normally allowed, you know, like, uh, you know, we have extra hoses to run across the hall, you know, and then you couldn't plan that ahead of time because someone would say, well, you know, that's not safe, right? People could trip over their nose and that sort of thing. But that's what we do. And this is like a back pocket plan. If nobody is building it and, and, and a pandemic actually occurs, we have six weeks now. Yeah, in six weeks, you can build a number of these. Can you control the flow, like how fast this goes up? I time, I time of flow? Right? Yes. So, Hear the alarm that you have. Yeah, you can see the alarm right now. There's a little bit of pressure, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, seclusion, the patient isn't getting any air there. And uh, it's not one for, uh, it's a loose thing out there. So there's, there's a couple other things that I thought, you know, could be done. We haven't worked on them yet. But this, if you want to have oxygen, it is uh, the one inlet valve. You could have, have a control, two inlet valves. Yeah, you can have a good team. Yeah, and then you have to have a third switch on there. And it's just that uh, so it's filled with oxygen, loose up, and the air to that level. And then the beauty of it is that it's 100% filled with oxygen. So there's no problem. Yeah, it's not like a lot of the other things. Yeah, yeah. 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 So just before you ask Clarence all sorts of questions, I just want to say two things. You know, uh, over the past year, like every time I wore it, because I actually was going to buy him a mannequin, but I thought they a couple of thousand dollars each, and I'm sure the hospital should, someone in the hospital could give him a mannequin that we can stick on and make it even more lifelike. Um, I'd like to thank Clarence and Jeff. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's uh, I think uh, very topical right now, and uh, even though it's just part of uh, pandemic planning, uh, we I think we certainly covered uh, a lot of stuff. So thanks, Clarence. Uh, good luck, and uh, we're all. I think we all should try and uh, support this. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, uh, I, I, met, I, I I left this out of my talk. Uh, Jeff Jeff has done a, a wonderful job with this. He built this prototype <coughs> in school on his own, and he in, in order, you know, he he, wanted, he said, I want to add something to it. I want to make it more than what I have done on it initially. I have some videos here. The ones that I made were really crude. And his is much more sophisticated. Um, and then he entered it into uh, the regional Waterloo Regional Science Fair. And he won the Award of Merit, Gold Medal in Senior Engineering, uh, University of Ontario Institute of Technology Innovation Award, Conestoga College Entrance Scholarship, University of Guelph Entrance Scholarship, University of Waterloo Entrance Scholarship, and Wilfrid Laurier University Entrance Scholarship. Then he also went to the Canada-wide Science Fair and <coughs> competed against all of the top uh, entries from all of Canada, and there he won honorable mention in engineering, and he won the Engineers Without Borders prize as well for the most humanitarian project at the fair. And he's also going to be, he's also going to be invited to the Engineers Without Borders uh, national conference in uh, February. It's on YouTube, by the way. To do that is just amazing. And as far as any support from us, I mean, we are the prime users of this, as, as you guys know. I mean, uh, to, to compare what this is and what the state of the art is right now, like today, at this point, if you want to come in sometime and, and see how a critically ill patient is being ventilated, what the options are, what monitoring is being used in terms of online live breath by breath, and monitoring that's available on the screen, I'd be quite willing to and I'll take you in or put you in with some of the staff to see what is done. It's going to further help you to enhance your your capability in terms of redesigning and you know making it more sophisticated. There'll be no problem at all.